live on YouTube. And we are live there as well. All right. Hello, friends. We're going to get started in just one moment. Uh, we're going to let the room fill up a little bit. We want to thank you tonight for being here on a unusually warm San Francisco night. It's been gorgeous weather here lately. Uh, we want to thank our friends of the San Francisco Public Library always for being part and sponsoring and helping for what we do around here. Uh, thank you, Ed Fuller and Gary Grossman for being here as well. And let's get on with some library news and announcements. The San Francisco Public Library acknowledges that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramucha Shaloni peoples, who are the original inhabitants of San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that the Ramucha Shaloni understand the interconnectedness of all things and have maintained harmony with nature for a millennia. As the indigenous protectors of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramucha Shaloni have never ceded lost nor forgotten their responsibilities as caretakers of this place, as well as for all people who reside in their traditional territory. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as first peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramitish community. We must embrace and collaborate meaningfully to record indigenous knowledge and care for San Francisco and all of its peoples. All right, and just some other upcoming amazing news. I also put um, in the chat box, I'm gonna put it in there right now for folks, a link to tonight's document that has that land acknowledgement that I just read, as well as links to upcoming news and events at SFPL and links to tonight's presenter and how you can get their book. I'm really happy about partnering with Zizava, San Francisco's journal and letter uh, quarterly publication who have been running for a very long time. So come check this out, September 29th, number 121, the family issue, and we'll have readers from this issue. And this will be in Zoom. Partnering with MOAD for Wally Shoyinka, September 30th at noon, a lunchtime event, also amazing person. Um, tomorrow night, we are Started, we have started way started celebrating Viva already, Latinx Heritage Month, and you can come in person tomorrow night at the main library, the beautiful sixth floor skylight gallery area under the Nautilus, and view the poets and listen to the poets from Flora Yacanto, who is a literary organization working to preserve the literary arts on the 24th street corridor of the mission here. Sunday, we have author Jaime Cortez in combo with Yosimar Reyes, amazing humans again. And this is all part of our Viva. Next week, Carolina de Robertes and Julian, Julian Delgado La Opera. So, so excited for those two amazing humans as well. And just like I said, we have so much coming up for Viva. And then starting in October, we head right into Filipino American History Month. Super excited again. Lots of great events with authors, poets, cooking. We have a nine author panel, which is going to be just, whoo, it's going to be an intense one. All amazing. Are on the same page this uh, September and October, which is San Francisco Public Library's by monthly read, encouraging you all to read the same book, is Carla Cornejo Villavincencio's book, The Undocumented Americans. And she will be in combo with Jonathan Blitzer on the 26th of October. All right, and the last literary push for tonight, SF Chronicles, Total SF Book Club, our third event. And this too, the Corette Auditorium. It says the Corette Auditorium. We're having an event in the Corette Auditorium. I'm so excited. Um, this will be our first event in the Corette. And I mean, since you know the pandemic closures. And it too will also be streamed, so you don't have to miss it. We are doing hybrid. And all right, without further ado, 
Tonight we are um, excited to have Gary Grossman and Ed Fuller, and they are behind the Red Hotel series. Um, pretty interesting stories. And, and I mean, interesting stories is how they, the two of you have come together to do this. I like that part of this. Ed Fuller is a CEO of Laguna Strategic Advisors, a global consortium providing business consulting services worldwide. He has served on both businesses and charitable boards during his 40 year career with Marriott International, where he was chief marketing officer, followed by 22 years as president and managing director of Marriott International. Gary Grossman's first novel, Executive Action, propelled him into a world of geopolitical thrillers, executive treason, executive command, and executive force further tapped Grossman's experience as journalist, newspaper columnist, documentary television producer, reporter, and media historian. All right, Mr. Grossman and Mr. Fuller, take it over. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Gary, do you want to start with a uh, discussion of how we got together, and then we can go from there? You got a great introduction there from Elaine. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, then we can play the trailer, too, because we do have a trailer for our, uh, our book. It's a good way to kind of kick things off. Maybe we go to that first, Ed. Is that? Sure enough. Okay. Uh, stand by. I'm just going to share my screen for a moment. And hopefully everyone is, uh, hold on one second. Uh, gonna share the screen one more time, make sure everything is right and it is. And we're going to see our trailer for Red Deception. Happened, Riley. Elizabeth, I was on the bridge when the truck exploded. This is right out of the report that I drafted for you. And then the attack in DC? Someone in your office leaked this. It came from inside. The terrorists followed it chapter and verse. I'm sorry, but there's going to be more. is not who. The question is why. And the answer to that, they want to keep... Gary, we're locked. Uh-oh, I think we might have lost Gary. Oh, his screen is still there. I'm going to ring him real quick. He may be enjoying the video. <clears throat> and I'll go up to the there we go. <laughs> last page. And there you go. Okay. Imagine the music still playing. Okay. Uh, well, uh, we are very honored to be here. Lovely seeing uh, people piling into and watching on um, YouTube and other portals. Whoops, okay, I gotta clear that out, hold on. Well, I'm gonna tell the story of Gary and compliment him so we don't lose <clears throat> any time for you tonight and to um, let technology go its way. Sounds so, good. <laughs> uh, Gary and I have been working together since I retired from Marriott in 2012. <clears throat> He'll tell the story of how we met. I kind of filled in Gary while you were gone. You okay. will not believe what I told them about you. So 
Uh, why don't you pick up the How We Met story and we'll get going. Okay, my apologies. Um, the, still, you know, a lot, it's like live TV. Anything can happen. Um, Ed and I met through a very interesting way, and I would call it a, a James Bond story that, come, that comes true. Uh, I was walking our dog, who I just let out a few minutes ago, out the door here, uh, and I bumped into a neighbor. His name is Bruce Fierstein, lives in the neighborhood, actually. And he was walking his dog named Shadow. Our dog is Thames. And kind of interesting that his dog is named Shadow because of the kinds of things that Bruce Fierstein writes. He was the screenwriter of the first three Pierce Brosnan James Bond movies. Why not have a dog that sounds like he's a spy? And Bruce uh, bumped into me and said, Gary, I'm so glad to see you tonight because there's a fellow I'd like you to meet. He uh, is on a board with me at Boston University and uh, he's interested in finding a collaborator to write a novel. Well, I thought, that's interesting. I've not collaborated with anyone yet in terms of novels, but uh, sure, tell me more about him. Bruce said, well, he's the former president of Marriott International. I thought, wow, uh, I have a Marriott, I have Marriott points, I stay at Marriott, but what could I possibly have in common with the former president of Marriott International? And he said, you have to meet with him. Well, I did. And within, I don't know, less than 30 seconds, I realized that Ed was as much in the anti-terrorism business as the hotel business. Um, his properties, uh, Marriott and Ritz, uh, were attacked in, uh, in uh, Jakarta, and they had to deal with the aftermath and learn from that. Um, getting getting uh, uh, guests out of Cairo at the fall of Mubarak, and likewise when Gaddafi fell in Tripoli. Um, he was the real deal, and I was sitting across the table from him. And I think, Ed, if I remember correctly, my first question to you was, so who do you have on speed dial? And I don't recall you told me at that moment, but I realized that that speed dial list was very long and we reached across the table and shook each other's hands and we've been working together ever since. And so we work as a pair and quite frankly, I couldn't have a better partner who has become really a great friend. So this has already <clears throat> had a benefit right there. Gary and I have different backgrounds and roles. His producer role was critical in helping to understand some of his theories in writing. And <clears throat> as Gary says, I'm the storyteller. I had done a book while I was working for Marriott, which was a business book, which was called You Can't Lead With Your Feet on the Desk, which is Gary's cue. <laughs> and it was strictly a business book, but I could do that. But when it came to writing a novel, which I wanted to do when I retired, just to have fun with it, <clears throat> the, the skill was not totally there. I can tell a story, but I cannot make the story fit together. And so Gary became, in my mind, a chef, mm -hmm. an individual who could really make the Boudoulis base come together and not get lost. And all those secret flavors work together. So <clears throat> we combine stories. We also worked on theories on what we wanted the book to tell you, but we wanted to have fun doing it. Well, that's a big accomplishment. That's already done. We're currently working on our third book and already thinking about the fourth. And we've been very excited about the results. And big interest in the audio portion has really increased some interest in the second book because it came out a little late. It is now available. So all in all, we have had that working relationship and uh, he's the um, chef and I'm the storyteller. And so you wanna invite us to a campsite, we're pretty good <laughs> together. 
And every time Ed and I get together, I learn more about the inner workings of security, uh, inner workings of keeping people safe, and the inner workings of smart people who are smart enough to work with intelligence agencies all around the world. And what you'll read in Red Deception uh, is basically flying off the front page and, and, and the cable news and the network news. Um, it begins with an attack on America's infrastructure. And America's infrastructure today basically gets a C minus. We are woefully behind fixing our bridges and roads, our water systems with a, something like 148,000 individual water systems around the country with very little national regulation. And the information to attack those water systems is as easy as going to, well, the San Francisco Public Library or the Los Angeles Public Library, or the New York Public Library, because so much of the information is right there. And how to break into some place, we're not trying to present a, uh, a novel that's a how-to book. In fact, there are things that we know that Ed has experienced that we don't put in, so it's not a how-to book. But we do know, in the case of Red Deception, America's infrastructure is vulnerable. Now, who's after it? in our story, and it won't be too much of a spoiler alert, our stand-in for Vladimir Putin. And that's a character named uh, uh, Gorshkov, Nikolai Gorshkov. He wants to do what Vladimir Putin wants to do. He wants to rebuild what was the old Soviet Union. He wants the, the Eastern Bloc nations back as protection from NATO. And he wants a whole hell of a lot more. And some of it began with red chaos, and it continues in red deception. Uh, it'll continue, I'm sorry, sort of it started in Red Hotel, the first book, it'll continue in Red Deception and continue with Red Chaos. And the real secret, the real secret sauce, the real fun that I have to work with is that so many of the stories are based on Ed Fuller's actual experiences. And hair raising, to me, breathtaking things that he's done to ensure the safety of people around the world. So, uh, number one, the name The Red Hotel, Red Hotel being the first book, really comes from a need we attained <clears throat> early in my arrival in 1990 on the responsibility for the international hotels. And that was driven almost totally by the fact that we had a well, we had a hotel, we still have the hotel in Cancun, but the entire executive committee was kidnapped. And so this was 1990, and I'd just come on board, and here I was trying to help our people down there solve the problem. Now, we haven't used that story, so I'm not going to go any deeper, but the fact was that said to me, and said to my staff, we need to get plans. We just can't sit here. You would be amazed that I've been teaching at UCI that not more than a few years ago did a major corporate HR come up to me <clears throat> and say, we don't have a crisis plan. And you all know this company and I'm not gonna put them on the spot we don't have a crisis plan. And we just had a crisis in Indonesia where the plant was under attack from the employees inside and out. We brought an Indonesian army unit over, recovered the plant <clears throat> and our guy paid the army some $20,000. And guess what? That's against the law for the Americans to pay a government agency under the terms of foreign corrupt practices. And he says, I need help. <clears throat> so I helped him. But the point to these stories is not legal systems per se, but having fun <clears throat> as readers of thrillers of trying to figure out some of the twists and turns and angles. I had lunch today with a friend. He just finished Red Deception. And I said, he said, I'm here to find out 
which one of these stories are the same st story that you told. Now, we're not going to let you out of the hook here and give you that lead. But he came up with four stories. Three out of the four came from real experience, and the fourth one did not. It came from Gary twisting the knobs and making things come together. And I said, number four is strictly us working together, but Gary's writing in hand. And he, he said, it's just amazing. So I'll give you maybe one example because it's short uh, that happened not long after the Mexico incident. Um, General Noriega in Panama, some of you may remember this, some of you may not. Uh, the attack from the United States on Noriega was to really get control of the Panama Canal back and address an American population of retirees in the country. The problem became immediately when we put troops in that land. Noriega, of course, was retaliating against Americans and he sent his troops to the most frequently used, but obviously all the hotels in Panama with the direct orders to get hold of the Americans and bring them to me so we can hold them as a form of a hostage. So they, <clears throat> our general manager was back in the US having an open heart surgery that was required very quickly. And so the team was all Panamanian and the resident manager was leading the hotel. And sure enough, he saw the troops coming. He knew they were going to come. He then, led them through the hotel. They happened to machine gun every room without stopping and checking. And I was down there about, oh, I'd say 48 hours later. And I can tell you that that was true because the holes were in every room. And then <clears throat> he took them down and he showed them the back of the house, housekeeping, food and beverage prep, and then through the laundry. Nobody was there, they left. In fact, we had 63 guests and what they had done was put the guests in the laundry, in the tumblers, in the dryers and just put them in, put dirty laundry in so there was good enough smell if they opened up the uh, bins and all 63 were hidden. We eventually got some support which is a total difference, another story that we won't bore you with right now, uh, and we haven't used, Gary. Um, and that whole thing came together, so everyone got out of the country. And they weren't all Americans, some were European, but the fact is they were safe. And that continued to focus us on keeping safe. So going back to the Red Hotel, the US during right after 9-11 <clears throat> formalized a color-coded security system, which you may not even know what level we're at. And I haven't checked in about a month, but might take a look one night. Mm -hmm. uh, and <clears throat> that worked in the United States but we were in 73 different countries ultimately. And uh, if anybody can come up with the US color, I think it's orange, but you'll have to tell me. And so we developed an entire protocol for different levels of protection in our hotels throughout the world. Now, I couldn't have, I can tell you that story but I needed to blend, I would need it to blend into a real story that goes through the Red Hotel to really Red Deception. And that's why the Red theme that stays with these books, Gary kind of gave away the title of the next book. It's called Red Chaos. We're not talking about the fourth <laughs> book at this point, though we, we needed to come up with the start of the fourth book 
to be able to end the third book without any um, errors in trying to bring the two together. Now, people will ask if, um, if the lead character, Dan Riley, is Ed Fuller. And in many ways, he is. I think Ed may be more handsome and debonair, but we're working on making Dan Riley all those things. Now, Dan Riley is the, is, the, uh, is the guy who is out there around the world uh, looking out for trying to outthink the bad guys. And, you know, as thriller writers, if we think of what could possibly happen, we have to know that rogue nations and, and bad figures around the world are thinking those things. And to that point, after 9-11, I really find this very interesting. After 9-11, among the first people who were called into Washington to the Pentagon and to the CIA, to the, to the White House, to the State Department, were they military experts? Well, no. They were thriller writers. They were authors. Uh, it was before I was writing novels. Uh, but they were thriller writers. They were screenwriters. They were people like Bruce Feirstein, who wrote those first three Pierce Brosnan and James Bond novels. They were the people who were thinking the unthinkable. And I think Washington and the rest of the country woke up realizing if we're not thinking what's unthinkable, then we're not going to be able to come up with what's next. And what's really interesting about working with Ed and sitting down and plotting a book and then writing with him is that he's teaching me to think, well, who's behind that next door? Um, who is plotting in a small way? You know, if you, I mentioned the water supply before. Uh, is it possible to poison all of the water in the, in the country? Absolutely not. Is it possible to create enough fear that we won't know what to trust? whether it's going to a 7-Eleven or at a restaurant or what comes out of our own well if we're, if we're living in a rural area. That's very possible. And with things like that, with people doing and, and coming up with plots like that, and I mean real life plots, not a plot in a novel, we've gotta be thinking, how do we fight that? How do we prepare against it? And infrastructure right now is at the top of everyone's mind. It's certainly Congress debating it. There really should be very little debate about what we need. We live in San Francisco. You live in a city relying on bridges. In Los Angeles, we are relying on roads and overpasses. Um, what kind of thinking are the bad guys doing about that? Well, Ed has taught me, and, and because I write from the comfort of my computer, which I'm sitting in front of, with contacts in government, in CIA, in law enforcement. Uh, but Ed deals with, and I'm still convinced you do, Ed, deals with them directly and did for the safe operation of hotels all around the world. Um, I, I, I have things yet to learn, Ed, who's on speed dial? You'll have to come over again and look first to find the speed dial <laughs> and because I still have the old-fashioned one that I can flip through okay but Gary Gary's right about some really critical things my favorite by the way I appreciated your comments Gary but I'm the older version of Dan not the younger <laughs> and uh smarter than Dan hopefully and uh the key thing for me is my favorite carrier or character is, of course, Vladimir Putin. And I use his name literally like that uh, and applies that. But the experience that I share with you and through the book comes from 22 years running that international division which took me to 150 countries and operated in 73. Every country with its own culture, every country with its own challenges, every country with situations that overlap to the point that we had 52 hotels in red zones while we were operating. That number has increased with the acquisition of Sheraton and Starwood. But Marriott during that time was not the original target, 
but we became a target. As we grew, as we got larger in scope, and we had at least three hotels, which the police, well, actually you can say four because one of them was hit. Our first one to be hit was really in Cyprus, which is Sri Lanka today. And that was five hotels successfully hit. That was our Italian restaurant, which got me off Italian food for a short while. And then the other four, the police told us very clearly, when we got the people in the room and behind the table, they said we went to the Marriott or Renaissance first to try to get in and we could not figure out how to su successfully, we may get in, but we weren't gonna get out and we weren't sure we could achieve the mission. And that was Mumbai when they chose other locations that included Athens, Greece, that included Jordan to a huge significant amount. And I mentioned Cyprus, but it also dealt with some other Indian cities that luckily we never got hit in also. And Pune, the, uh, which is the educational center of India, we had a clear attempt on our courtyard there and uh, ultimately they gave up. And what happened in most cases, we have to convince the owners that if they did not bring up the standards to our standard, they weren't going to be in our system. We put safety of our employees, safety of our guests, number one. And that's Bill Marriott, the synonym this is Ned Fuller creating it. It was a philosophy of the company. And we built systems to ensure that they were safe when they were in a Marriott hotel. When we found errors, and when you work in all these different countries, you're going to make an error. Most of these countries didn't know what Marriott even meant. Uh, when you find errors, you change them, fix them, recreate them. So when we had the explosion in Jakarta that Gary mentions, um, that was a very interesting situation from a perspective of somebody planning and gives you an idea how in much they invested. The florist in the hotel, in the Marriott and the Ritz Carlton, but his office was in the Marriott, was a vendor, was not an employee of the hotel. He developed such great relationships throughout the hotel, the security team, and he brought in through the back dock his daily need of palm trees and whatever. And of course, he you can see him on tape, friendly wave and the guards waving back. So when the attack occurred, he had built the two detonation bombs with a vest. And the two bombers came in, checked in, one in the Marriott, one the Ritz. At the time, they went over to the Marriott, picked up their vests, and went to sleep. The next morning, they came down, the bomber going back to the Ritz, these hotels were connected by a tunnel, uh, went back to the Ritz and blew uh, the restaurant up with several guests in the hotel. And then the other bomber went to a chamber of commerce meeting, American Chamber of Commerce, and took out people that I knew from the first bombing. I happened to be in Vietnam at the time so I was at the hotel by that afternoon. And so my security guy was there at that time, Alan Orlob, who you might recognize in the book as Alan Cannon. And uh, he was there when the bombs went off in the hotel and acted appropriately. But the point was, how did that happen? 
And I would leave that question with you, but I'm going to let you off the hook because Gary just winked at me to go ahead. <laughs> no. And that uh, is very clear that the florist was bringing in the parts in the plants. And our guys would look on top of the plant, maybe even run their hand through the soil, but the items were well deeper in the containers. And at that point we said, without dogs, we're not gonna be able to really find these kinds of uh, challenges, which took me to a new education called dogs. And I, I was delighted to find out that security dogs that look for bombs have a 45 minute work period. And then their union calls and <laughs> they go over to the, the hotel that we built for the dogs, a fairly spacious, uh, spacious one. And then they take a break and the next shift comes on. We also, found through some, and Gary, I missed the Puna story, I'm sorry. Um, we found some things that found potential bombers using both the dogs and observation. But the key to the whole program is that you wanna protect your associates, your guests, and make sure that your hotel is safe. And it requires a team. Uh, Ed, Ed was there in the field and the field was in all the countries that he was talking about, uh, danger zones and hot spots. Uh, but his team was the head of security. His team were the operatives who uh, were in law enforcement in those countries. Sometimes the team ends up being, what, the cartel that you have to work with to, to get people out safely. Uh, there were kidnappings of staff that you had to negotiate people's uh, return. And these stories, these stories are real, but unlike a James Bond or a, a Bourne novel or a Bourne movie, where it's just basically one guy doing it. Uh, the thing I, I learned from Ed, and I'll get to a question that is up here too, is something that I'd also learned from my dad who was in law enforcement in New York state. And that is, if you see something, say something, share the information with other people. It's what didn't happen a lot prior to 9-11. Can you imagine? Somebody comes in, you're running a flight school. Somebody comes into your flight school and they say, I want to learn how to fly the plane. Okay, here's what we do to teach you how to fly a jumbo jet. And here's what you, you, you do. Here's what we'll teach you to, to land the plane and to take it off. No, 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 no. I'm only interested in knowing how to, how to fly the plane not land or take off, wouldn't that make you, if you were in that job, think, I better tell somebody. I better share that information. I better call the FBI, which by the way, Ed has relationships with, and uh, they vetted elements at the very beginning of our next book, and they've read it. Uh, you've got to really, you've got to share the information you know, you know. And getting to, and there are just a couple of questions up here. I'll take one, Ed, you can take the next. Uh, what is your process? And this is from Bill. What is your process from gathering Ed's information, uh, questions to getting them to publishing? Uh, how do I form that? How do we form that? Well, we meet. We meet regularly in person uh, through the pandemic. A lot of it's been certainly on Zoom and Zoom chats. But um, Ed and I will go through a plot. Okay, how do we want to go from here to here? And then we try to think about what stories of Ed's will work into them. And, and what really, uh, what kind of action can really be very helpful in, in telling that story. And God knows there's 22 years worth of stories that Ed's had, that Ed has, whether it's, it's getting people, as you'll see in Red Deception, uh, again, not giving away too much, but if you have three buses in order to get people out of a danger zone, and you load those buses up, you better make sure that one of the drivers hasn't lost the key in the middle of a battle. And you'll read that in Danger Zone. So uh, that's the process. Then we write and we go back and forth. I'll do a draft, send it to Ed. 
Um, he'll read it, more notes back, uh, come up with ideas that we plant within the book. Um, things add more action, um, add more suspense. I mean, things come in action, suspense, intrigue, and character. And, and often we'll say, well, you know, we could have another character here um, that, that can move things along. And there's also what we uh, call sexpionage. It's espionage that the Russians have played very successfully in that game, as had the Greeks and the Romans, as does the United States. And there are characters who will use that. Uh, there's a, uh, a, um, a Russian general, former Russian general in the KGB, who now lives in the United States, Oleg Kalugin. And he says, um, very well-known statement, in Russia, um, well, I'll start with America. In America, you train your men and your armed forces to stand up for their country. In Russia, we train our women to lay down. And that's the sex being our side. Now, Ed, there's a question that actually works into uh, Red Hotel. It's about cybercrime. Do you ever feature cybercrime in your books? Uh, Ed, have you experienced cybercrime in your career? Uh, in our situation, we are describing <clears throat> a period of time that a lot of different things have occurred. You're specifically asking about cybercrime impacting our hotels. Mm -hmm. I can assure you that sometimes the crime is not the criminal, it's the government of that country. Uh, I was in Miramar and I got a call from our CFO from Washington and uh, he said, I need to go over these budget issues because you're all the way over there. And we were going through them on the phone and it went a little over an hour. I came down to the GM's table where we were having lunch and the GM was in hysterics. He says, you have caused the government turmoil because their tape recorder only goes 45 minutes and you went over another half hour. And so he says, they're scrambling around trying to get another tape linked up to our lines. That was back in the 90s. I'm sorry, that was back in 91 or 92 when you didn't have the technology level we do today. <clears throat> but I can take you also to a situation today where within well, let's use the Beijing Olympics. The Beijing Olympics, you've got to remember, certain hotels are totally wired. And that means when you're in that hotel, everybody is being watched or overheard through a significant system. And again, you might have surprised if a keyword kind of puts an emphasis on that room. Nothing surprising there. And uh, even when I retired in 12, I can identify five countries that every time I was on the phone or at that time computer, uh, I was being screened and they were either holding, keeping or maintaining that material that I had. When you got to Beijing, you've got to remember the secret police are the key authority in that city, but your own security department is also the authority in that city because they work for the secret police. They don't work for the hotel company even though they're paid by them, but their leadership is. And when we were getting ready to go into Beijing, one of the Lufthansa GMs, they had their own hotel system at that point, told us a story that his resident manager was dating a local girl. And uh, the other morning he said, the, sec uh, the uh, security director came in and told me I had to tell this guy to get away 
and never speak to this young lady again. And he said, and these are Germans. So he said, well, I'll try to deal with it. But the resident manager came in and he said, I'm in love. You know, I really love this woman. I want to take her back to Germany. And so, boom, uh, the, he says, and we're going away for the weekend and I'm going to ask her to marry me, which they did. The next morning, he came in with pictures of the entire event everything, every moment, and put them on the table for the general manager. He says the Secret Service has picked up the young lady, and she's in jail, and your resident's got one week to get out of the city, or he'll never leave. So there are a ton of those stories. And during the Olympics, one of our company key executives who I have utmost respect for got upset because the newspaper put out that all of the hotels, Hilton, Hyatt, Marriott, anyone you want to list, were in the process of installing computer and uh, phone security systems unique to each hotel because they couldn't keep up with it in a central capacity they were putting staff in each of the hotels to listen. Mm. And <clears throat> this key executive, who's a wonderful person, said, you can't do that. And I said, what do you mean? She said, you can't do it. And I said, we are not only doing it, we're installing them and helping them to connect the wires. Because if we don't, if we don't, we're out of the hotel and out of the country. And we at that time had about 72 hotels. And <clears throat> I said, what we're going to do is put a letter under every door and in every check-in telling our guests that they're being monitored. Hmm. So there's all levels of technology, but over the 22 years, we went from the basics of pictures and there's some overlap into the sex side of the business that is tied to hotels because hotels are meeting places. And I was in Kuwait just a day before that war started. And um, I saw the uh, upper area uh, which was where all the broadcasters on two networks were set up. And I said, how's everything going? Are you getting your information out? They said, whatever they want us to. <laughs> so you've got to remember that this thing goes on and on and on, but it's certainly entered and it's now personal. Ed, um, uh, get back to something uh, on Joe, uh, who sent in the question on cybercrime. Just give me a number. How many attacks uh, are there or attempts to infiltrate the company daily? You can assure, be assured it's usually 100,000. 100,000. And that was when I was leaving, because what they're trying to get to is the reservation data, and in our case, the Bonvoy data, which has got very critical name, address, mm -hmm. credit cards, and everything. And when we acquired um, Starwood, they had less defenses than we did, and so there was a hack. While I was working, we got hacked, and nobody could figure out how I got hacked in the detail that they got. And it turned out to be in Puerto Rico, I carried all of the uh, casino uh, ownership responsibility, which required me to fill out an information piece for the, uh, re re well, it's not a republic, I'm sorry, Puerto Rican government mm -hmm. uh, to, ensure that I qualified as a representative. And as it turns out, Puerto Rico called one day and said, we were hacked. 
And, so, and that, by the way, works into Red Hotel, our first, right. our first novel together, because they couldn't get through the hotel system, but they could hack through the gaming system that is in Puerto Rico, and through that get in, uh, got into the hotel. Uh, and I have to share uh, this with you. Uh, Bill writes that uh, you're like the William Burroughs of hotel security. And that is, it's great, great praise. I, I, I put it this way, imagine sitting with, and you're getting much of this right now. You're sitting at dinner table, um, a party or whatever, and you're sitting next to the person you discover to be the most interesting person in the world with, with stories. That's Ed Fuller. That is my relationship working with Ed Fuller. And just when I think that I've, I've heard the topper, there's, there's another story. And that's why the series of books will go on because it's, they're fiction. They're, they're thrillers, they're political thrillers, but they're steeped in reality. And the reality is the experience and also the reality of tips. And I'm gonna turn to Ed again, what kind of tips, I'm ready to book a trip to New York or San Francisco. I'm ready to go abroad to China, stay at different hotels. Uh, I'm ready to um, just go out and have a good time. What do I need to think about, Ed? Well, Gary, uh, you're going to have a good time out there, whether I talk to you or not about that. So you, you have the flavor of a lot of our customers. And frankly, uh, you would be amazed how many people are not looking at the back of the door in their room. And I know everybody listening has gone into the room. There's this little ugly piece of paper but it has the most valuable information you can find to help you get out of that room if there's a fire, and now even more so other challenges that are out there. <clears throat> and it also tells you where to go. Now, unlike the airlines, we don't have the lights going down the hallways yet, but frankly, that may come sooner than you think. And so Marriott, was very, very proud of not losing a guest at all in a fire or a situation. Suicides, other things that happened, but in the case of life safety, Marriott, Bill Marriott just wouldn't tolerate anything but high degree of quality in the system. Even still, fires would occur, usually because somebody was smoking in the bed. And candidly, that leads you to think about something. You're checking in, you're tired, but you would really like to sit down, have a drink, maybe enjoy the big balcony, but you didn't book that room. You booked a regular room. And the young lady or gentleman behind the desk says, well, we, for $25 more, can put you in a suite up on the 47th floor. Actually, the hotel I operated in Boston had 53 floors and then a couple on top. And uh, so the response is, oh, God, that's great. Well, you need to remember that unless you're in a super big city like New York, they don't have fire equipment that reaches the 47th floor. And if you're in a smaller city, even though they have high rise hotels now in Des Moines or other places, you've got to remember they generally don't reach above seven. So you'll find me now that I'm retired down in the lower floors because it's just safer. And then there, I've got over 30 others. We don't want to bore them. And I saw some more questions come in, but there are a significant amount of things you need to be conscious of when you travel, especially internationally. That's the takeaway. Those are the little Easter eggs that are in Red Hotel and Red Deception and will be in uh, Red Chaos as well. A question, uh, have our books been optioned? Well. Bruce Feirstein, who I mentioned earlier, uh, wrote the first three James Bond 
uh, movies that Pierce was in. Um, he's the screenwriter attached to it. Uh, we're talking right now about uh, options and where they could possibly be picked up, but we're talking with and meeting with studios uh, now. Um, we think it would be a great series and um, we'd be there on set to say, why is Dan Riley's character staying on the 24th floor? He needs to be on the seventh floor. Well, Dan Riley always gets the best suite in the hotel when he visits, as did Bill Marriott. Then he would kick out for Dan Riley and get the better suite. <laughs> and it was important to the associates, especially internationally, to see the person that was in charge get taken care of because they were aspiring for those jobs. And since globally, we tried like the devil to always have a development program to bring the international local person up into the executive positions. I'm very proud to say that of the presidents, uh, three that are operating, I'm sorry, two of the operating are locals from India, from China, also from Germany, and I'm very excited about the fact that under them are a whole series of people that started with us. And we spent a lot of time, money, and education to make sure these people would be part of our team. Loyalty became the most important thing. And since I don't have a stopwatch on me, Gary, or we don't have questions pending, I'll keep Cairo to the end. Okay, and uh, my apologies for getting up because uh, our <laughs> there's a little emoji of a dog. Our dog was uh, just crying outside, but I must say, um, Thames, walking Thames, our dog that night was what brought Ed and I together. So we enjoyed having a little personal appearance right here. Uh, I Can do we want... have him as a security dog in one of our hotels? No, we can't. But there is a dog named uh, after my first dog in, in uh, Red Deception. And he's the president's dog. I don't know if I ever told you that. That's uh, a very interesting uh, part of technical uh, research that we did uh, on an assassination attempt that is maybe one of, I, I'm happy to say, one of the cleverest things that, that uh, I've seen and we developed, and that's in Red Deception, and I, and I hope you'll enjoy that. The book is at, or will be at the San Francisco Public Library. Uh, I also encourage people to go to your local bookstores, uh, support them. They certainly need walk-in and call-in um, uh, customers, uh, Amazon and Barnes and Noble and other booksellers as well. The Audible just came out about two weeks ago and sounds great. So if you're driving or stuck in traffic, um, uh, just waiting to find something else to listen to at night, Red Deception and Red Hotel are absolutely uh, go-to go books. Um, Ed, just what are you worried about in terms of the future of travel? Well, the future of travel right now is so complex with health and other issues. What really concerns me, quite frankly, is the volatility of the passengers. That has become a real challenge for airlines. And while it's not in every location, it's always a concern. Travel as a whole in, in 2019 had the highest number of international visitors coming to the US and an even larger market around the world because the middle class has grown significantly in a lot of markets, China being not an exception. And in many of these countries, real estate and their objective for the individual, clearly for the uh, government and some of the major companies, real estate is huge, but the family's not spending money on owning a house. They're spending the money on taking trips, seeing the world. And one reason that that customer is significant 
is the size of that market. And quite frankly, it was sitting very close to the number one position when we all ran into COVID. What I'm concerned about is, and this is where I get a little off uh, key and have my opinion, what I'm concerned about, the best way to introduce peace is to know people from these countries. It takes down barriers, tremendous barriers. I still have a lot of friends overseas and the communications is sometimes better with them than people in the United States, except for Gary. And so <laughs> the, the fact of the matter is, if we don't take down some of these personal barriers, travel will always be that important. If they do come down, personal relationships are developed. You wanna go over and meet the folks. If that doesn't happen, we're missing out on a wonderful opportunity and travel will return, but it's how you travel, why you travel, how you use the time to travel if you just run into an old building and run out without studying the history and understanding the people and meeting new friends, you haven't been on a trip. You just ran in, ran out, and you didn't get any essence of what's there and understanding other people. Now, I have an Italian wife, and so I can tell you that Michaela is wonderful and is more Americanized than uh, anything else now. But it, when we go to Italy, when we did go to Italy, it was like we had instant friends, not from her family, but just meeting people and being able to communicate. Sorry, that's my soapbox. I don't oh, know. It's, it's a great one. And what I've learned from Ed and I think we're still yet to learn as a country as we get involved in other countries, is that there's a mission when we go into countries, but more important than the mission is understanding the culture. And Ed has taught me that you just don't go in with your American team, you're recruiting people from that country and they're teaching you what you need to know about Absolutely. their country. Uh, and that makes it safer for everybody as evidenced by the story that you told about Panama and Noriega, you relied on the, the good will of the people who were in place to protect the people uh, in the hotel and get them to safety and out of the hotel without being behind those doors that were shot down by Noriega's uh, military. And I would only add to that, Gary, that these people were Panamanians. If they believe that country came first and values and morals came second, they might not have responded how they did. We always supported the local country, right. except when we got into countries that were under major difficulty, then we kept our mouth shut. And <laughs> <laughs> and work with the people as the individuals they are. And again, I'm not watching the clock, but be it kidnappings, and we've had several, and be it how we rescued people from different countries during crisis. Uh, and that went from the Latin American to the Middle East and to Asia. The key was to convince our employees that we're not American, that we cared about, mm -hmm. and that we took action to help them and save their lives and their families' lives. And we didn't forget about them because they weren't American. Uh, there's a lot going on right now that backs that up. And I also dealt with that in Vietnam. So it's important that we as a company, I'm not preaching to every individual, but we as a company looked out for our associates, whether they were American or not. 
And that's what was a major push in everything we dealt with. Well, read the fiction in Red Hotel and know that it, I don't know if it's backwards or forwards there for you. You're doing fine. Okay, but uh, know that so much of it is not fiction, it's reality. Uh, it's the world as it is today and the world that we have to be aware of is we know if you see something, say something. And I hope that you'll all see Red Deception and Red Chaos. And I think that's probably our cue to say thank you. That was, that was a you. perfect ending. Thank you so much, um, Ed and Gary, and great advice and sentiment um, on why we should be traveling. Thank you so much. And yes, check out the book. You will have to place a hold. Unless you're into eBooks, you can get it instantly right now. And we also have a really great system called Link Plus. You can get it from there as well. All right, friends, library community, Ed and Gary, 100%. Thank you. Thank and you. have a wonderful evening. Amazing Thank stories. You. Thank Bye -bye. you for your questions, everyone. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Anissa. Thank you.